everybody, it's Pilar Gerasimo, founding editor of Experience Life magazine, and I am really delighted that today we have with us one of the experts featured in this January issue of Experience Life. He authored the article titled Hungry No More, uh, Zero Deprivation Weight Loss. We're joined today by Dr. David Ludwig, who is just also launching this very wonderful book on which the article was based. This is not the book, as you can tell, it's just a piece of paper, but it's the cover of an excellent book called Always Hungry. And it is There's a lot um, of words that would happen after that cover. <laughs> Yes, many words. It is much thicker than this. But the book is about conquering cravings, retraining your fat cells, and losing weight permanently. And no better expert to advise us on that than Dr. David Ludwig, who is a Harvard professor, medical school professor, a weight loss expert who is world-renowned and respected. And we are delighted to have him as a valued source in Experience Life magazine on a regular basis. Thanks so much for joining us, Dr. Ludwig. Well, thank you, Pilar. It's just great, great talking to you. Well, we really appreciate the um, steady voice of reason that comes from your offices and your reports uh, and your research that you've shared so generously over the years. And for folks who haven't seen you before and might be wondering why they haven't seen you before, I sense it's because you've been very busy actually conducting a lot of the research that many of the experts we see more often typically refer to when they're trying to explain how fat works and uh, how weight loss works. Tell us a little bit about where you've been hiding out the past 30 years? Yeah, the ivory tower, I guess. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I have um, been running a group for a research group for a little over 20 years now that has focused on looking at how food affects our hormones, our metabolism, and of course, our risk for obesity and chronic diseases. Chronic diseases today, as you well know, your magazine talks about regularly, is threatening you know, the viability of our society. We have ever-escalating Medicare, Medicaid costs, a risk for declining worker productivity. You know, we've been trying to look at what it is about our diet that is causing this massive epidemic of chronic disease, all modifiable, most of it modifiable. And um, so we've been, uh, my group has been doing a research that is focused on clinical trials uh, where we ideally randomize people to various different groups, and behavior is hard to change. So people don't change their behavior very much. As a result, their diets don't differ. And not surprisingly, nothing much happens with outcomes. And that has led to this notion that all diets are alike, and the only thing that matters is compliance. You just have to eat less and move more, and that's it. But, we, you know, we felt that the, this is really... Um, that the state of nutrition research has been severely deficient. I mean, imagine doing a study of a promising new cancer drug, uh, but it turns out that the investigators didn't provide the drug in an appropriate and convenient way to their patients, or, you know, the patients had some logistical barriers in finding pharmacies to buy the drug, so they didn't take the drug. Would we dismiss that as a promising cancer treatment because the patients didn't improve? Of course not. We'd say it was a failed clinical trial. So we've been trying to look deeply at the mechanisms um, that relate food as medicine to our body weight, chronic disease risk. How does that happen on a molecular level? And as a uh, practicing physician, I also have been trying to translate that knowledge into practice in my clinic, and I see patients every week. So the combination of doing the research seeing patients and also talking about it in, uh, at, at the medical school and with uh, doctors has been a very satisfying career for me, but uh, it's sort of time to step out into a little bit more um, with the publication of this new book, which translates basically all of my work over the last 20 years into a practical plan for people to follow at home. Well, it's a huge service. I mean, I think there are two things that strike me in what you said. One is, you know, th that the stepping out from behind the, the curtain, the ivory tower, getting out into the real world. I mean, you've been dealing with real people in real bodies this whole time, but suddenly dealing with the general public um, it is a really different thing in a world where they have been so misled and so confused and so topsy turvy whipsawed by, you know, headlines that are different every week low fat, high fat, high protein, high carb. Most people can't make sense of 
of that. And even when they do try to adjust their diets, like you said, they often end up eating more or less what they were eating before with a few minor variations and then wondering why it doesn't work. So it's interesting. Real life world thing. We did this fun uh, pilot study with you and some experienced life readers and ran about 100 people through the program, many of whom had really amazing results. And I think a lot of what you focused on in the book was making it practical for people, helping them understand what does it really look like to increase the fat in your diet to say 40% of your caloric intake. You know, those kinds of numbers get bandied about what is low fat versus high fat. Oh, it's this percentage of your diet and calories. Most people have no idea what that actually looks like on a plate. And you really went to a great deal of effort, uh, I know, with uh, your fabulous chef and partner to make sure that the uh, the program was a doable program and also still a healthy program, that this isn't just about weight loss. This is really about radically improving people's health and vitality and happiness overall. Can you talk a little bit about what the experience of the pilot program was like from your point of view? Because we got to see it on the editorial side and uh, got to hear lots of great testimonials. But what was it like seeing people go through this program in a very organized way for the first time in this new you know, out there in the world way. Well, well, first, it's been so wonderful partnering with Experience Life to do this pilot. Um, You know, just an amazing collaboration. You have such a fantastic team. And that really supported us to create materials that made this program alive for our participants well before the book was in a form that it would be ready for, you know, public release. And we took the you know, the experiences with the pilot participants helped us fine-tune the program uh, so that the, we got made sure that all of the recipes, meal plans, and the rest of the other supports were exactly right in the final book. But let me just step back for a quick sec. Um, you know, the first part of the book addresses the science. Um, second part is the program. But we're, we're taking the science that we are considering is, is based on a, a radical, a simple but a really a radical premise. It's that overeating doesn't make you fat. The process of getting fat makes you overeat. Now, that sounds radical, but it's based not just on the results of research from my group for 20 years, but research that dates back literally a century. I mean, think about it. Um, We've done, our group hasn't, but many groups for decades have done what's known as force-feeding studies, where subjects are given hundreds to a thousand calories more a day. And of course they gain weight, but what happens to them? They're they're just as miserable as the people in the starvation studies. They lose their appetite entirely and their metabolism speeds up in an attempt to get rid of those excess calories. Once they're off the force feeding protocol, their weight comes naturally back, right back to where it started. So this and the underfeeding studies in which people get very hungry with weight loss and their metabolism slows down, suggests that there's a sort of a body weight set point. And the conventional approach to weight loss, unfortunately, neglects this basic fact that body weight has more to do with our biology than our willpower. And unfortunately, people have suffered tremendously psychologically, emotionally, as a result of that. People get blamed for not being able to control their body weight in a way that they'd never be blamed for not being able to necessarily avoid other medical problems. So our view is that uh, this is a a really just a basic misunderstanding of the science. We try to take dieting and turn it on uh, on its head. Uh, The approach is to retrain fat cells to release their stored calories. When that happens and calories flood back into the body, Hunger declines, cravings vanish, metabolism speeds up, and weight loss happens much more naturally. So the same thing that people experience after bariatric surgery, you know, they just, the weight just melts off their body for a while. Um, But in this case, we do it with molecular surgery and not a knife. So that's the basic science. The key is to lower insulin levels and calm chronic inflammation. And when that happens... You know, it, insulin is the ultimate fat cell fertilizer. Once you lower those levels, things in the body change automatically and the weight loss occurs naturally. And so the meal plan and the other lifestyle supports are designed to help fat cells 
settle down and stop hoarding too many calories and participate in a more cooperative way with the rest of the body. When the fat cells aren't hoarding calories, the whole body's metabolism shifts into high gear. And so we do this with a three-phase diet. Phase one is a really high-fat diet. Fat is about the best way to lower insulin levels and calm down fat cells. Fat cells actually really love fat. Um, and so uh, it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And, and then lastly, I'll just say that we have vegetarian options for uh, essentially all of the uh, recipes, and we have gluten-free options. So grains are not necessary on this diet, but many people like to include them, and grains can be part of a, you know, some of the traditional grains can be part of a, a, a healthful diet for most people, but we have gluten-free options available too. But it feels like right now there is a kind of growing fever pitch of excitement around the possibility that we can actually enjoy significant amounts of dietary fat and our health can benefit. Why do you think it has taken so long, um, given that, you know, a lot of the experimenting that people have done has seemed to be pretty successful? You've had journalists like, you know, Gary Taubes and other uh, folks talking about this in the general culture, but it's still resisted by a lot of folks, including some well-respected experts and doctors who continue to sing the low-fat praises of diets that, you know, are whole food diets for the most part, but they really pull out almost every kind of the added fat you can imagine. Why, why so long? Why the long resistance? Um, well, I think in part because this paradigm of e eating fat makes you fat is so inherently appealing, especially to Americans. You know, if you don't want fat on your body, don't put fat into your body. And then scientists jumped uh, onto the bandwagon with a, a relatively simplistic view of energy balance. They said that fat has twice the calories per bite per gram of protein or carbohydrate, which is true. Um, but who cares? I mean, it's <laughs> much more satisfying. It fills you up much more. Um, so they thought that somehow if you just get rid of fat, uh, you'll naturally lose weight and eat less. Um, you know, that you just cut back calories, uh, move a little bit more, and your body will take care of itself. But as we talked about earlier, that completely neglects the fact that, you know, while that concept might work for toaster ovens, it, you know, humans aren't machines. When we lose weight, the body adapts. And if we lose weight the wrong way, it adapts in a way that makes ongoing weight loss increasingly more difficult. We get hungrier and hungrier, and our metabolism slows down. Then, Because there's not enough calories in the bloodstream. It's all being hoarded in fat cells. And so what do you do? Well, you cut back more. And that only makes the situation worse. This is a battle between mind and metabolism we're destined to lose, unless we're you know, just enormously um, disciplined. And even if we could stick to it, it wouldn't necessarily be good for our cardiovascular disease risk factors. You know, we did a study in which we, um, I, most of our research is done in uh, humans because, you know, what makes uh, a rat fat doesn't necessarily make a human fat. But it, we did this one study um, in which we gave rodents identical diets, in this case, the same protein, fat, and carbohydrate. But in one case, it was fast digesting, so-called high glycemic index starch. In the other case, uh, less, you know, slower digesting starch. The group that got the fast digesting star starch gaining, started gaining excessive weight on the same number of calories, suggesting its metabolism was slowing down. So what did we do? We did exactly what the conventional teaching would have us. We cut back calories. We gave that group less food than the other group so it wouldn't gain excessive weight. And then at the end of the study, we looked at body composition. And despite having the same body weight, it had almost twice as much fat and thus less lean tissue. Its cardiovascular disease risk factors were off the roof. Um, so just controlling calories or even just avoiding weight gain doesn't mean that what's happening inside our body is good for our health. And if you're extremely hungry and dealing with cravings, 
and fatigue, it's probably not a problem with your character. It's probably a problem with your metabolism. And, uh, and the second is treatable. You know, it's really interesting. I, I feel I've heard so many people talk about their relationship with their cravings and with their hunger as crazy making, that they, they literally feel they're being driven insane, that they can't stop thinking about food. It distracts them. They can't stop eating it. Once they do, they go on these kind of jonesing uh, love affairs with certain kinds of foods. And it's so interesting that they do, we all have a tendency to judge ourselves first and find ourselves lacking in discipline or willpower. It's so interesting to me that, you know, you so you chose to title this book, Always Hungry, question mark. I think a lot of people can probably relate to this title. I think, yes, yes, I am. As a scientist, how are you relating to the psychological part of this story of, of, of having heard people talk about what it feels like to be always hungry, um, the misery that comes from that? How do you separate? And maybe you don't need to. Maybe that's what you're telling us is that the science and the empathy really work together in this way. Well, I've, you know, I've, I've sat with patients for more than 20 years, and very few people who come to my clinic haven't tried and failed dozens of diets. And there is enormous guilt, um, shame, self-blame, uh, which is driven by a society that views obesity as a weakness of character. You know, my message here is it's not your fault if you happen to be fat. It, this is a biological problem just like any other. Now, it's very interesting. You know, I, we've been hearing more lately um, about the microbiome, for example, too, and the amazing transformations that people have in their health, uh, not just their physical health, but their mental health, their emotional health, their sense of purpose, even as their microbiome health shifts and changes. So much of what you focus on in the book, it seems to me, is really about valuing the vitality of the whole human system and as opposed to just moving one lever here or there and mechanistically trying to manipulate someone's metabolism it's really about understanding how to build a healthy way of life starting from a fresh like forgive yourself if you're fat don't blame it on yourself let's just wipe the slate clean try something try this you know it, it strikes me that for folks who have been through the cycle of diet after diet after diet there's diet fatigue too where they start to lose hope that it's possible for them to be healthy and happy and weight uh, at a healthy weight how do you encourage someone who said oh you know I've done Atkins I've done South Beach. I've done this. I've done that. How is this different? Why should I try this? It's every every single thing I've tried before. Even if it helped initially, I gained back more weight. Where do you begin to negotiate with someone who's just desperately uh, wanting a change in their life but feeling hopeless? Right. Well, um, the, the first thing I'll say is that um, when you don't get the science right, you have to rely on very gross uh, behavioral um, forces to push you along, you know, your willpower. All right, I'm going to just cut back on this. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to get onto the Stairmaster. And we can summons that effort for a short period of time. But if we're not lining up biology and behavior, it's ultimately going to leave you worse off than you started. And that's unfortunately where much of America is right now. So, you know, my goal in coming to this as a Somebody, I've, dedicate, I've really dedicated my career to trying to understand the basic science, is to get it as accurate as possible so that every effort that's put into following the meal plan gets you the maximum reward. So in this case, since you're working with your biology, you don't have to count cut calories or cut back. There's no deprivation. When you work with your biology, you don't feel deprived. In fact, one of the very first things that you should feel on a diet is an improvement in your overall well-being. And that's consistently what we saw with the pilot participants. I know you've seen those stories. And Often very quickly, so, within a few days, people started feeling completely different. Yeah. yeah. 
I think that the one barrier that I've, when I've described this to other, most people, when I describe it to them, say, oh my God, this sounds amazing. I'm going to get it immediately. This, I'm starting to eat this way today. Uh, and it's very much the way I've personally been eating for a long time. And it's been, it's that approach has always worked really well for me, but I had to kind of figure it out for myself. You've done all of the really difficult work of making this scientific for people and giving them a practical guide, the right recipes. It, it's difficult for me to imagine someone objecting to it once they've tried it. That said, one objection that I do hear sometimes is like, oh, but it's got all this saturated fat. And even though there's a ton of science that says saturated fat is not the culprit behind heart disease and weight gain, there's still a lot of anxiety about it. And you and I have had a number of conversations about, you know, the kind of sorting out the finer points of saturated fat and the sources of saturated fat in anybody's diet, the presence of other nutrients in combination with saturated fats. And recently there was this whole new dust up of the World Health Organization report out right in the middle of people starting to go, okay, so maybe saturated fat's not so bad, <laughs> kind of like torpedoed a lot of folks and freaked them back out into the I am afraid of all saturated fat space. Talk to us about how you're responding to that. Um, if that study kind of, or that report, I guess it's really not a study, it's a report of previous findings. What kind of impact is that making in the circles that you run in? And how are you talking about it with folks, given your very much expert background? Well, let me just say that I, first of all, our our diet, uh, the always hungry solution, as we call it, um, is high in saturated fat only with respect to conventional recommendations that have aimed to eliminate saturated fat, and make it the public health and nutrition enemy number one. You know what we're what we're what, what I think many people are recognizing now is you know most of my colleagues. Uh, there may be a few who would disagree, but I think the majority, the consensus opinion now is that saturated fats um, aren't a health food, but they're not um, the main problem in our diet. And that by over-focusing on them, we've caused more problems than we've solved. You know, in animal studies and uh, even in human studies, it looks like saturated fat can um, in some conditions, promote inflammation relative to certain kinds of unsaturated fat. But it's probably not quite that simple as you were implying. It's both the kinds of saturated fats, that not all saturated fats are alike. There are medium-chain saturated fats like in coconut, and there's longer-chain saturated fats. There's odd-chain, as in dairy, and even-chain, more meat. Um, and how that saturated fat interacts with the rest of the diet is really important. With the combination of saturated fat and refined carbohydrates, I don't think is a good one. Yeah. So bread and butter, um, you know, it's just not the best way to start a meal. But without the bread, the butter, well, first of all, the butter between the two is the more healthful component. Yeah. Um, unless this is a really old world whole kernel, you know, weighs you six know, pounds. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and so short of that, the butter is the more healthful component, and without the bread, the butter wouldn't be so much of an issue. Yeah, it's interesting. You know, I think that that problem of where studies meet reality. You know, that so many of the studies that um, torpedoed saturated fats looked at their intake in in heavy meat eating diets that also tended to be very absent other healthy characteristics of, uh, you know, having vegetables and, and phytonutrients in them. And I still think people have a tendency to think very black and white about these things. And again, coming back to the, the value of the N of one and the value of trying something out and trusting your body's response to it. I think that almost anyone who chooses to eat in a way that you're describing, which is really quite moderate. I mean, there really is it's not, it, it sounds extreme. You know, it's, a, it's a high fat diet, but you said it relative only to what we've been taught is, is sort of the, the healthy, the so called healthy norm. But putting all of this like whole healthy food that's rich in phytonutrients, rich in fiber, rich in all of the things our bodies need to function well, um, and then also surrounding it with suggestions like, you know, getting up and taking a little walk after dinner. I love that. It's like such a sensible way of um, reducing stress while you improve metabolism and digestion. 
digestion and creating kind of a pleasurable experience around eating that isn't just eating itself. Really insightful, smart way of thinking about weight loss and about health improvement, which I really wish we talked about more, you know, in this culture. I know that our readers are going to want to connect with you more, David. I could talk to you for hours. I hope we get another chance to have you come talk to us about some of the more detailed elements of this as more people have had a chance to experience. And we'll talk about what what hopefully will be a, just a a tsunami of health a change that will happen as the result. But in the meantime, for folks who want to connect more with your work, connect with you, I know they can find you through your website and also can order the book through the website, uh, drdavidludwig.com, and that's Dr. D-R, David Ludwig, L-U-D-W-I-G.com. But you're also on social media now. I've been seeing you popping up on Facebook and Twitter. How do people find you in the social streams? You know, that is quite an accomplishment for somebody over 50. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to start getting into social media. Um, so people can find me at, uh, uh, well, you mentioned the website, drdavidludwig.com, and my social media on Facebook is uh, at David Ludwig MD. And then let me, let me just say the one, one, one other thing. Um, while the book, first part of the book is focused on the science and the second part, a program to follow, um, the epilogue of the book is sort of, in a certain sense, my soul, which is looking at the greater environment, the political issues, how conflicts of interest, how special interest has conspired to create such a toxic environment, making the healthy choice the hardest choice. So in just a few pages, you know, we look at that and I put forth a 10, pa- a 10 point plan to bring some sanity back into our life. And, you know, we can all, once we've brought healing into our lives, join together to help make the world uh, focused on public health, not private profit. Yeah. I'm so glad you mentioned that, David. I I love that you included that in your book. And I do think it really helps to broaden our our vision of this problem beyond the personal um not just in terms of like its personal responsibility but in terms of the the per- the potential beyond us changing our individual bodies of really changing the world that we're living in and making it a more just lovely lovely place to be um i think it could get easier for a whole lot of people and you know we launched this whole revolutionaryact.com thing um out of the same set of insights that there's more to it than just uh, six packs and skinny jeans and people worrying about their weight and getting on the scale every day. There's a lot at stake in our culture, in our economy, in our our communities, and in our families. And I think you do a really... Yeah, this is a question of social justice. And you've been really in the lead of this, Pilar. I I really have to congratulate you and experience life. You know, this is not uh, a new um, fad that you've jumped into. You know, this is you founded your career on, on um, being revolutionary acts that support social justice. And, you know, ultimately, if we don't have social justice, if we, we, we're a wealthy country, we have enough food for everybody, you know, and it's got to be good food. You know, we can't be raising this generation of children on junk. Children are our most precious resource. You know, without them, where are we? And this, this is really... You know, we, but we have to begin by bringing healing into our own lives. Just, if anything, to have the energy and vitality to go out and champion these critically important causes. And if we're going to remain vital as a society, we can't be spending hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars on healthcare costs. We have to reinvest in our infrastructure and you know, create a sustainable society that's capable of withstanding some of the unfortunate external challenges on us today, you know, with all, you know, all that's happening in the world. But the place we have to start is healing ourselves, our family, and then healing society. And that, that is really, there is no more noble cause than that. And you've been just, um, you know, a, uh, one of our guiding angels here. Oh, wow. Thank you, Dr. Ludwig. That means the world to me coming from you. And um, thank you so much for leading the charge on, on the science and, and now, you know, speaking up for what you know to be true, both scientifically and socially and humanly. And again, you know, again, I would encourage people to pick up a copy of Always Hungry. And whether you read part one, part two, or part three first, <laughs> you read the whole book because it's really an incredible, um, it's an incredible guide to a healthier way of life. 
life. And uh, I, I really look forward to seeing the wonderful results that the book will have on, I hope, millions of people. Dr. Ludwig, and I hope we get to talk to you again soon. It's been really fun. Thanks for having me.